Welcome to the Angry Nerd Podcast. My name is Arshawn Wade, aka the Angry Nerd. Uh, the Angry Nerd Podcast is taped in front of a live Facebook audience from my mom's basement. The Angry Nerd Podcast is made possible, excuse me, is brought to you in part by a couple of bad life choices and a few bad shattered dreams. The Angry Nerd Podcast is made possible by money that my wife gives me from my SSI check, a chick named Joni, and proceeds from listeners like you. If you want to be one of the listeners that helps contribute to this show getting better and better, go to Cash App. My Cash App is dollar sign The Angry Nerd. You can leave us a couple of twos and fews, or you can pick up one of the Angry Nerd Podcast t-shirts for 20 bucks plus shipping and handling. If you want one of those and you follow me on Facebook, inbox me with your address, your size, hit me up on Cash App. Otherwise, if you listen to me on Podbean, Spotify, and YouTube, you can reach out to me on customteasbyarshan.com and just let me know in the description that you want one of the Angry Nerd Podcast t-shirts and we will get you taken care of on that side of things. Uh, If you're looking at one of the shirts that I have on tonight, it is Black Jobs Matter because we don't only matter when we're being killed in the streets. We also matter while we're right here in the United States of America and we're not getting equal wages. We're not getting equal rights in the workplace. And I think that that is something that is going to be detrimental moving forward for the black community and the low income community at large. So hopefully there is something that's gonna catch on and people are going to really get behind the movement of Black Jobs Matter because there are a lot of black people in the United States of America who are not making the equivalent of their white counterparts on the wage side of the game. So before we get too deep into things, I wanna say shout out to DMX, shout out to his family, Uh, Prayers be with them. I'm hearing conflicting things, but I think a few reputable main media sources have have confirmed that he's passed on at 50 years old. It's it's a horrible thing. Uh, Those of you who know me, who've been listening to me for a while, know about me and rehab and what my relationship is with sobriety and everything. So I have a special place in my heart for people like DMX who leave here due to those circumstances. So Shout out to them, and just out of respect, give me one second, let's take a moment of silence for DMX. All right, man, like I said, peace, blessings, and positive energy to DMX and his family and his camp, and I hope that they are able to uh, get through this. And it's it's actually interesting that we had the uh, demise of DMX right here on the cusp of tonight's topic, because... The album Hotels by Jasmine Sullivan is such a good album. I don't, I think I was following somebody's post on Facebook or something like that, and someone mentioned the name of a particular song on that album, and it caused me to listen to the entire album. The The, the album is uh, Hotels by Jasmine Sullivan, but the uh, particular song that jumped out was uh, On It or Sit On It. Very provocative song. I believe that the first time I listened to the song that I got pregnant. I think I'm pregnant and I think it's Jasmine Sullivan's. It was a great song. Very provocative. I love that it's a super hypersexual song, but it doesn't have a bunch of explicit lyrics. I love when you're clever enough to be nasty and you're also grown enough to be classy. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I've always been a fan of Jasmine Sullivan all the way from the first song that I heard by Jasmine Sullivan was... Uh, bust the windows out of your car and the reason I love that song so much although I was probably one of the guys that she probably would have busted the windows out of his car back in the day I was probably that dude but I still love the song because I believe the song like you cannot sing that song the way she sings that song unless you've actually busted someone's windows out I believe that through and through you can only have that type of power that type of emotion and control in a song like that, if you've actually had that life experience. Almost like being a fight announcer who's actually been a fighter. A fight announcer who's actually been a fighter is going to have a little more passion when he speaks about fighting than someone who isn't. Can you get that? Okay, cool. So, Hotels, I looked at Hotels and I I went through the entire album and I have applied the what do you call it? The stages of grief. I have applied the stages of grief modality to the Hotels album, and I've actually broken the da- the album down into the four stages of grief, which are, according to the modality that I'm using, are denial, bargaining, anger, and acceptance. And funny thing, 
there's only like seven songs on the seven or eight songs on the album it's 14 songs but in between most of the tracks there's an interlude where the ladies there are different ladies sharing their life experiences so it breaks down to eight songs and it's a very interesting thing that there are two songs in each of the stages of grief Arshan, why would you be using the stages of grief modality applying it to this song excuse me to this album well I've been reading um, the relationship dismount I've actually read it four times by uh, Zoe Williams and he says to look at a relationship like a death the ending of a relationship like a death and when someone dies, we grieve. We, we grieve our loved ones. We grieve our pets. Some of us, if you're like me, I've, I, I'm not ashamed to tell you that I've cried several times when I've lost pets and I've lost animals in my life. I'm an animal person and it's always been hard on me when an animal dies. So I know a little bit about grief. So I understand grief. So I thought it was very interesting that Mr. Zoe Williams would say to grieve a relationship. A failed relationship should be looked at as a death. And so when you apply the four stages of grief, you go through these stages. It takes about 90 to 120 days, I think he says in the book, roughly, depending on the length and strength and severity of the relationship. It could be longer or it could be shorter. So what I have done is I've applied the denial, bargaining, and anger, and acceptance modality to the album. See, stage one, which is denial, sometimes we have to go to Webster and get a working definition real quick. I got one pulled up. Denial, the action of declaring something to be untrue. Now, understand what those words mean. Denial doesn't mean that something is untrue. It's the act of declaring that something is untrue. Have you ever broken up with somebody or someone broke up with you and you just kept saying, I can't believe this. How, what the F, how did this happen? This can't be over. Guys, I know there's some guys who can understand what I'm about to say. No, baby, please, baby, please, no. You're the only one for me. There's nobody else. I can't live without you. I'll just kill myself. Boo. No, of course that's not the way it's supposed to be handled. But in the denial phase of grief, that's where we find ourselves. And if we look at the two songs, there are two songs that we find on the Hotels album that fall into this category. Those songs are Bodies and Girl Like Me. In Bodies, she's talking about how, you know, she's partying, staying out late. She doesn't know... She doesn't even know who this guy is in the bed. Like, where did I meet him? She's Life is kind of falling apart for her. And that's how it happens in the denial phase for a little while. You kind of get into this self-destructive behavior pattern. Excuse me. You kind of really just kind of go numb. You kind of go numb a little bit. Sometimes women can find themselves in clubs drinking and picking up random men. Well, hell, sometimes men can find themselves drunk in, <laughs> in bars picking up random women. So I think that's pretty universal if you decide to process in that way and if you're a person who processes grief in that manner. So when you're in the denial phase of grief, what you should be looking at is reality. What you should be looking at is trying to get a, get a clear understanding of what actually happened versus what you want it to happen or what you think should have happened. But we can't look at things realistically. Most of us are so egotistical. I say us as in human beings. Most human beings are so egotistical. That's why we can't fathom that somebody broke up with us. Someone left us. Why are we talking about breaking up? Why are we talking about being left? I'll tell you why. Because this album is riddled with trauma. And I also think therapy. Because it's so, and, and, and musically, sonically, it's a great album. But let me tell you, content-wise, it is a troubling album. It shows that she went through the four phases of grief. I want to know who the guy was, or girl, I don't know. People are batting for both teams now, swinging both ways, however you want to word that. I want to know who it was that inspired this, 
And I also want to know, just for my own little inkling, did she get some sort of psychological help putting this album together? Because I find it very curious that this album falls right in line so perfectly with the information that I've read on, on grief. Excuse me. So girl like me, she's pretty much, she's still in the blame phase. You know, she's still blaming the guy. You're going to turn a hoe out of me. That's what she says. She says, you're going to make a hoe out of me. Let me tell you why I boo that. Because if you say that someone else made a hoe out of you, you're absolving yourself of the responsibility for the actions that you're taking of being a hoe. That's just what I think about the situation. And I think that it's a, a, it's a terrible thinking error when people say, you made me do something. But don't get me wrong. That's not to say that someone's actions do not inspire movement in another person. I'm not saying that, but you cannot put the onus for that movement onto the other person. You can't do that because then, like I said, it absolves you of responsibility for your own actions. And you can't do that. But that's what you see in Girl Like Me. She's still blaming the guy and she's p pissed off at guys. She's telling them, well, y'all be acting like we crazy. And y'all the ones be driving us to it. But that sister can sing her face off. I was almost convinced that I was a piece of crap and it's my fault that she feels this way. Uh, probably in the grand scheme of things, in the k karmic view of things, I've probably put some funk into the institution of womanhood's karmic circle. So maybe I am partly responsible, but I'm not, you know, individually responsible for what's wrong with women and the relations between men and women. But I felt like that because she's such a strong, she has such a strong voice and she just, I just believe the things that she sings, you know, so vehemently. And I think that a lesser intelligent person would be influenced and inclined to believe that relationships are broken down and horrible the way that they're depicted in some of the songs on the album. As good as they are and as sonically pleasing as they are, some of the content matter, eh, little sketch. But it falls in line with where we are societally with uh, women of a certain age bracket. These are things that we hear on a daily basis in conversation. These are things that we experience on a daily basis in our own personal relationships. Whenever we have the a, um, gonads or the testicular fortitude, to be honest. Mm. Sorry, I had to turn my uh, <laughs> I had to turn my my ringer off on my phone because as I record this for Podbean, Spotify, and YouTube, as I said earlier, I broadcast live from Facebook, and I got to make sure that the broadcast from Facebook isn't interrupted because my homies and homegirls on Facebook want to hear the info. Anyway, moving right along, the second stage of grief is bargaining, which is a very strange term. It's a very strange. Um, way to uh, look at a thing. But anyways, let's look at how Merriam-Webster defines bargaining. Okay, negotiate bargaining. To negotiate terms and conditions of a transaction. Well, here's the thing about that. Had anybody who has been a chronic messer upper in relationships like myself, you know exactly what I'm talking about when we talk about bargaining. Baby, please, I'll never do it again. I'll change. I'll be different. I'll bathe on a regular basis. I'll wash my feet. I'll keep my boots outside. Look, you'll never have to wash the cars again. I'll do everything that you want me to do. Baby, please, 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 please. Oh, come back. Whatever you do, please come back. I do everything. I'll be a freak in the sheets and a lady in the streets. I do whatever you ask me to do. Please come back, Tyrone. I love you. Uh, we've all been there. Anybody who's ever been in any type of relationship. Why do I just assume that everyone's been in a toxic relationship? Because everyone has been in a toxic relationship. And anybody who says otherwise is just a liar and I hate them. Anyways, I'm kidding. But I digress. Bargaining. Baby, please. I'll do anything. When you move into the bargaining phase of grief, it's when you can't. You, you move past dismay and you're moving towards acceptance. Acceptance is the final goal. You want to get to a place of acceptance. But on the road to acceptance, you find yourself at a little bar called bargaining. I know how I'll get her back. I know how I'll get him back. I'll do this. 
I'll get a new haircut. I'll check. I'll, I'll start wearing different clothes. He always complains about me not keeping my hair and nails done. I'll go get a mani pedi. Well, you know, she always complains about me not eating better. I'm going to be a vegan. So we get into the bargaining phase of grief. And when we're talking about a relationship, when you're bargaining at in this capacity anyway, I don't want you to confuse it bargaining with compromising. But this is a negative type of compromise. When we get into bargaining, this is toxic compromise. This is saying, I will change my DNA if I have the ability to do so in order to be with you. That's not what it should take to be with a person. Once you get to a, that place, it's over. It's been over, actually. Because you should never get to a place in a relationship where you lose the essence of who you are in the name of being with someone else. Catch that dirt. So we look at songs, put it down, and my favorite song on the album, on it, sit on it, where basically she's willing to compromise whatever she has to compromise in order to be with this guy or in order to re receive the sex from him that he's get that she's she's getting. Give me one second to my listeners on Spotify, Podbean, and YouTube. Let me look at the comments real quick. It looks like Shayla Frazier's got something for me. She says, see, she says, see, I'm about to listen to this album. LOL. After, <laughs> after the podcast, though, LOL. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Shayla, for tuning in. Uh, it's a really good album. It's a great album, in fact. But like I said, some of the subject matter does, is, is startling because... I believe it's clinically driven. And if that's the case, that will lead me down the uh, rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and stuff like that. But that ain't tonight's show. We'll do get to the conspiracy part of it at a later date. Right now, we're going to keep on moving on. But anyways, earlier this week, I actually did a video on Facebook that got taken way out of context. So anyway, I was doing a parody video of the song Sit On It by Jasmine Sullivan. And um, yeah, it just went bad. It turned it, I don't know, everybody thought it was like a strip tease or something like that. Like, no, I guess I was on the front end of the of the sit on it challenge. So <laughs> nobody had any idea what I was doing. Everybody just thought I had sexy music playing in the background and taking my shirt off and acting crazy. <laughs> so I was way ahead of my time on the whole sit on it challenge. So that went bad for me, but it's a great song. But you watch the compromise in the song. I want to sit on it. But first you got to show me what you've done to deserve it. There's your transaction right there. We're looking to make a transaction. Society has taught us to be transactional in our relationships. I can only be your friend if. If you now don't get me wrong. There should be reciprocity, give and take in a friendship or a relationship. But that should not be my sole purpose for being your friend is to receive something from you, is to get something from you. That cannot be the nucleus of our relationship, what we get and what we give each other. That's a byproduct. What we give and what we get from each other should be a byproduct of our relationship based on our mutual love and admiration for one another. That's the way that that should work. But the equation has been flipped upside down. We've taken the reciprocal of that equation and we have made that our norm. What have you done for me lately? Are you going to give me something? Are you going to break me off? We get into this bargaining phase and when we have this mentality, this bargaining mentality, it serves us very well if we're going to the market and we're trying to buy apples in Kenya, but it's not going to fare too well in a relationship because what happens is you give up vital parts of your personality, of your emotions, of your thought process, of your life to somebody for something that is very superficial. So oftentimes we see breakdowns in communications and relationships because we get to this place in the relationship where the relationship could be at a fork in the road, the relationship could be on a decline and we start to bargain. I'll do anything. 
That's where we see ourselves losing ourselves. That's how you see yourself wearing those pink Bermuda shorts, walking that fluffy dog, standing in the middle of the dog park on your off day, instead of hanging out with the guys, working on your cars or racing your cars, which is what you would rather do. Wait, let me get out of my business. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But that's how you find yourself losing yourself in a relationship once you get to this dangerous bar known as bargaining. So moving right along to the third phase, the third stage of grief, which is anger. The third stage of grief, which is anger. And I characterize anger by the two songs, Pick Up Your Feelings and Price Tags. Pick Up Your Feelings, excuse me, it's a beautiful song. But it's one of those songs where it's like, there's a difference between moving on and then just getting angry. A lot of girls think that because they're angry and they're talking disrespectfully to a guy that they've, they're they no longer with, that they're over him. Oh, F you, come get your stuff. whoop de whoop de whoop They think that conducting themselves that way means that they're over you. Oh, uh, I'm not bothered. I'm not bothered. I'm unbothered. Um, based on your tone, ma'am, you appear to be very bothered. You appear actually to be the opposite of unbothered. You, you seem supremely bothered, but they'll say they're not bothered. Or you'll get the guy who says, I ain't messed up about her. She can do whatever she want to do. But when she calls and says, hey, little man needs some diapers. Hey, don't you got a new boyfriend? Man, tell him to buy a little man some diapers in if he all over there at the house and everything. You're not over a person because you're angry with them. Because when you're truly over a person, you don't have to be angry. You don't have to be shitty. There's no need for any of that. We can be civilized because I don't have any emotions towards you that way. So when you do something, I don't take it personally. But you continually take things personally when there's still feelings there, when there's still emotions there. So everything is going to be taken personally. And when you're in this anger phase of grief, Everything is heightened. Uh, like in the song, pick up your feelings. Hey, don't forget your feelings. Hey, don't forget to pick up your feelings. People who are healthy and who have moved on and who have transcended the bull jive that was the previous relationship don't rock in that space. They just don't. They're in a good space. People who are in good spaces typically don't do shitty things to other people just funny it works out like that though excuse me so when you look at the, the next song which is price tags which is basically man drop that bread drop that bread okay whatever i'm gonna get cute i'm gonna go shopping i'm gonna spend all this guy's money i'm gonna eat his food i'm ordering lobster i'm ordering stupid stuff like lobster soup sandwiches you know what I'm saying? Like I'm out here ordering crazy stuff. Hey, use Cristal champagne to marinate my lobster tail for my lobster soup sandwich. You know, like she's like, she wilding, she's wilding out, you know, but it's all out of anger. And here's the thing. You have to recognize where you are in the stages of grief. If you're in the anger stage, it's very important it's very important for you to process properly when you're in the anger stage because what will happen, you can cut off the grieving process and stay in anger. Here's the thing. You meet the next guy or you meet the next girl and you operate from that space. So before you can start your next meal, you have to clear the table from the previous meal. Otherwise, you're about to prepare a, a, a messy table. You're about to prepare food on a table that has junk on it. You have to clean that table. Clean the table, and then you can set the table, and you can set the stage for the next meal. But if you do not do that properly, if you let anger, ancient wisdom, a.k.a. the Bible, teaches us when you're angry, you give a strong foothold to the devil. That's what they teach us in the Christian faith. When you're angry, it doesn't say that you give a foothold to the devil. It's very specific right there with the language used in the Bible. 
you give a strong foothold to the devil. So anger is one of those fleeting emotions that has the ability to cause long-term and permanent damage if it's not processed the right way. So it's very important that you process anger in the right way, especially when we talk about relationships, because you will go into the next relationship. And if you have not processed these things in the proper way, what happens is everything that looks like something that you've previously experienced elicits those feelings and emotions. So if Ray Ray used to always leave his shoes at the door, when Tyrone leaves his shoes at the door, even though Tyrone does none of the same stuff that Ray Ray does, those shoes next to the door will be a trigger. And guess what emotion it's going to trigger? The anger that used to get triggered when Ray Ray would leave his shoes right there. And guess what your initial response is going to be to Tyrone? It's going to be, how many times I got to tell you not to put your shoes by the door right there? How many times I got to tell you to put your shoes in the laundry room? And Tyrone's going to turn around and look at you very peculiarly because this is the first time he's ever heard anything about moving his shoes and keeping them in the laundry room. That's because you have not resolved the anger phase of grief from the previous relationship. That's why I love the, the name of the book in one respect and I hate it in another because the relationship dismount. You have to stick the landing. And you can't enter into the next routine or the next relationship without sticking the landing from the previous relationship. And you can only do that once you properly process. And if you have not found a way to reconcile the anger stage of grief, grieving the relationship, you are not going to be able to have a successful relationship moving forward. And you're going to wind up in a vicious cycle of fail relationship after fail relationship. I have a personal friend of mine who I love very dearly, and she she's found herself in a situation like that. And it's very difficult to talk to other people about their problems because oftentimes when we have these issues, we're not looking at ourselves as a cause of any of the problems. When oftentimes we play, excuse me, every single time we play a role, but oftentimes we play a more significant role than we actually think. Most of the time we spend, we're, we're out here, we got our peepers and we're looking, we're looking at other people, our partners and their behaviors, our coworkers and their behaviors. And 99% of the time, we're not evaluating ourselves, our behaviors, our intentions. I have the voice of an asshole. I can't help that. And oftentimes what I find is, it's like I say things and I know how it sounds in my head and I know how it sounds if I put it on paper, but somehow or another, when it goes from my brain to my mouth, it just turns all assholey and anything that I say just sounds like I'm an asshole. So what I've learned to do with people that I care about, people that I don't care about or people who I don't, you know, I feel like probably need me to be a little bit of an asshole to them. I don't do this, but most people in my life, I will take the time to explain, excuse me, hey, I know what I'm about to say right now sounds like an asshole because that's just my voice and I can't change that. But listen, I mean the greatest of intentions and I mean all due respect. And I have found that even though that is breathy and that's wordy and it takes a whole effing lot to get all that out just to say your piece, it's worth it whenever you want to maintain a relationship, whenever you want to maintain a healthy relationship. It's important to explain to people where you're coming from, especially if you're about to give them some information that can be seen as a slight or a critique. You wanna make sure that they know that that critique isn't a slight, it's coming from a place of love, care, and concern. So you take, I take the extra time to go ahead and explain that to people before I give them information or advice or anything like that. I don't know, it's just, I, 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 I've, I've listened to playbacks and I'm like, wow, why do I sound like an asshole? It's just, I don't know. It's just how I sound. And I'm actually a sweetheart. I'm a really nice guy. Anger, a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, 
or hostility. I believe anger deserves a bomb drop. And I'm so sorry to my brothers and sisters on Facebook Live who can't hear the bomb drops and can't hear the background music and you just hear my voice and probably my, my son playing Fortnite in the background. That's probably all you guys get to hear in my voice. So, but I am working on getting the, um, the right cable so I can get it hooked back up the way that it needs to be. I was pushing out too much, too many amps for the cable that I had. It was too small. So that's why it would the volume would skip and the audio would click out and I wasn't I just wasn't getting good recordings with it so I had to go back to the drawing board on that but anyways moving right along but those two songs pick up your feelings and price tags they encompass that third stage of grief which is anger oftentimes when you're in that anger phase you feel like sharing your hurt with anybody in your immediate vicinity. And I know it sounds cliche because we've all heard these adages like hurt people hurt people, but it is so true. It is so easy to be mean to people when you're already feeling bad. It is so easy to misuse people and mistreat people and be disrespectful when you don't feel good, when you don't feel loved, when you feel like the world is against you because you just lost your relationship. This was supposed to be your person. That's my Gray's analogy. Uh, Grey's Anatomy shout out right there to any Grey's Anatomy fans. Uh, we're not going to get too deep on it because that's uh, very sentimental to me. But I digress. You found your person. And for some reason or another, or probably a thousand reasons, if you're like me, it went bad and you guys, you guys are going your separate ways. Well, here's the thing about that. How do we want to go our separate ways? Do we want to go our separate ways in anger and hatred because you got to remember that this person that you're parting ways with, you thought this was your person. This was where you were going to spend every moment of the rest of your life on this little marble that they call Earth. And now that's ending. And if you're anything like me and you've been married once or twice or three times, um, then it's a very disheartening feeling because if you've been divorced before, you really thought this was the one. Anybody who's been divorced knows that that next situation, serious situation that you've been in for three or four years, this has got to be the one because it's one thing to be a div divorcee, but a twice over divorcee, oh, there's something wrong with you, my friend. So it's easy to stay stuck in the anger phase of grief, but it would behoove you and the quality of the rest of your life to figure out a way to process that, process that in a pro-social positive type of way so that you can move on to our final stage of the grief process, which is known as acceptance. Here we have arrived and I have a definition for acceptance. Let me scroll up just a little bit because I was lazy. I didn't put it on my whiteboard for some reason. I didn't feel like putting my definitions up. So I have to scroll up. What was the point of putting the whiteboards up, Arshan, if you're not going to use them? I know. I get it. Anyways, agreement with or belief in an idea, opinion, or explanation. Willingness to tolerate a difficult or unpleasant situation. And I think that's the part of the definition that I really wanted to drill down on. Willingness to tolerate a difficult or unpleasant situation. Because we all know that breakups are breakups are tough. Breakups are extremely tough. Uh, I don't think anybody, I mean, unless you're a pimp. I think I've even heard pimps say that, you know, they've been heartbroken when a certain prostitute's left. You know, and it's like, and I will say that my good brother Terrence Brewer has joined us in the chat. And that's why I mentioned the pimp reference because <laughs> um, even pimps, feel feelings about one of their prostitutes leaving them. If a man and a woman break up, there are feelings behind it on both sides. So, but anyways, getting back to the Hotels album, the two songs that encompass the final stage in the grief process are Lost One and The Other Side. Now, Lost One to me was just anybody who's dealt with a recent breakup or anybody who's had a really bad breakup or anybody who's been the cause of a breakup. This is a song for you because it's really about accountability and taking responsibility for your actions 
but still not wanting the other person to go. Still not wanting them to leave. I know that I screwed you over and I know I did you bad, but please don't love nobody else. Baby, please don't love nobody else. And I know that's selfish. I know that's wrong. You've got absolutely no reason to be with me. There's no way for me to make you happy. But please don't fall in love with anybody else. I know how terrible that sounds. But please. And this song was great. It's a really great song. I keep saying that the entire album is great. But this was where I saw a... I saw a bit of maturity in the album. I saw a bit of maturity in the uh, in Lost One. Because here it is. I'm accepting responsibility for what I've done. And I'm also voicing the fact that I don't like it. I don't like the way it feels. Anybody who's ever caused someone to break up with you, you know what I'm talking about. I want this relationship to continue. I know you caught me with your sister and her friend, but I don't want it to be over. I still want to be with you. I want you to figure out some kind of way to forget that I had your sister and her homegirl in the, in the beach house. I want you to forget that and still love me and be with me. I want you to know that I'm sorry and I don't know why I'm stupid and I do things like that. That's a joke that never goes over well at all. Nobody laughed. I was looking for laugh emojis over here on Facebook. For any of my listeners on Podbean, Spotify, and YouTube, these mofos did not laugh. My boy Terrence Brewer said it wasn't me. On the shaggy side of the game, it wasn't me. She said she caught me on camera. It wasn't me. I'm, I, I get it. But anyways, the acceptance, the acceptance phase of grief is a tricky place to be in. It's a real tricky place to be in because I I see false acceptance all the time. And I see, I don't watch Housewives of Atlanta and stuff like that very often, but on the couple of times that I was in the hospital waiting room or something like that and I saw an episode, I remember seeing Nene Leakes, excuse me, sorry, I had a burp. But, I remember seeing Nene Leakes use this phrase and she kept saying it over and over. She's like, I'm in a better place now. I'm in a better place. I'm in a better place. You know, okay, well that's different. I'm in a better place now. I'm in a better place. And I call that false acceptance. That's that's really that's really that's really false acceptance because when you're really in a better place, you don't have to broadcast it. When you're really good. When you've really moved on, it doesn't have to be broadcasted. Other people will see it. You see it in the movies oftentimes, and you'll see where the uh, the person who's gotten over someone else, they have this glow about them. And that's it. When you've done the breakup recovery process the right way, that's how it'll happen. It will, it will be where people say, man, there's something different about you. Hey, man, I don't know. Is this a spring in your step? Uh, you just seem, or women, you'll see a woman, you say, oh, you just look so radiant. You aren't pregnant, are you? Da, da, da. Tss. Oftentimes, other people, when you have done the relationship recovery process the right way, you won't have to tell people, I'm good. I'm in a better place. They're going to see that you're good, that you're in a better, they're going to comment, wow, man, you're in such a better place than you were last year. Man, you look so, oh, I didn't think you were ever going to, ever going to pick your, pick up the pieces after Derek, but here you are, you're getting it. You started your business and you're being an entrepreneur and you're living your dreams and you're doing everything, doing everything that you wanted to do. And it's great. The accolades for properly going through the relationship recovery process will come from other people. The second song um, on the Hotels album that I attribute to the fourth stage of the grief process known as acceptance is The Other Side. I really enjoy that song. It's a fun song. Uh, the Other Side's a fun song. But you've gotten to this place where, like, you can live again. You get to this place where you feel like you... It's like you... You're riding a bike... And you've gone over some hills. I don't know if anybody's ridden the bike in the ghetto. They don't have a lot of sidewalks. They got busted up concrete. 
And then once you get to the more affluent side of town, now you get smoother roads and you get sidewalks and you get bike lanes and things like that. And in the relationship process, you just came out of the anger phase and you're moving toward acceptance. So the road's getting smoother for you. And this song, The Other Side, kind of paints that picture. Now you're seeing hope. Now you're seeing good things on the horizon. And now that you can see these good things on the horizon, now you are almost ready to start the next phase in your journey. The next relationship or the, the next marriage or the next job, the next career move, whatever it is, you're ready to jump on the, you're ready to jump into life off of the shoulders of acceptance after you've properly completed the four stages of grief for your relationship. You have to grieve the relationship. Why? Because this person became a part of your psychology. This person became a part of your DNA. This person became a part of everything in your life. Let me tell you something. When you've been with a person for an amount of time and you have a strong enough bond, even as a man, you will find yourself missing things that you didn't think that you would miss like hugging somebody or kissing somebody or waking up to somebody every morning or kicking somebody's shoes into the closet. You will miss small things that you used to argue and fight about. You will give up anything for this person. This person literally becomes a part of who you are. This person literally becomes a part of everything that you do. And all of a sudden, they're no longer here. All of a sudden, that person is gone. You have literally lost a part of who you are. And there is trauma that goes along with that process. And there is therapy that needs to take place. And there's healing that needs to take place. There's growth. There's maturity. And there are dozens of emotional barriers that are going to need to be repaired, some of them destroyed because they no longer serve us. Sometimes there are barriers that we have created that we needed for a period of time in our life because of some trauma that now need to be knocked down because that barrier just caused me a problem with my person. I had a person, God blessed me with a person and somehow or another I ruined it or maybe the situation just went awry because this wasn't my forever person. This was my for that time person. Or as the good brother Zoe Williams will say in the relationship dismount, this was a stepping stone person. This wasn't my cornerstone person. My cornerstone person who is out there that God has for me, this special person who was created for me, this special person who is going to be everything that I wanted this person to be that they couldn't be because it was impossible for them to be anything than who they were. That person that's out there for me. Well, in the interim, I need to be doing everything that I need to do to get myself right. Because if I'm of the mind that God has someone out there for me who's going to meet these needs and who's going to be what I need them to be, and I am going to be enough for them, I'm going to be adequate for them to meet their needs, the needs that they have for a mate. When God links me up with this, with this woman, when God links me up with this man, ladies, you need to listen. When God links you up with him, have I done all of the work that I need to do in order to be what they need me to be for them? Or have I been a selfish, whining little brat rolling around with my pillow talking about, oh God, where's my man? Oh God, where's my man? Oh God, where's my man? When I could have been reading some books, gathering some information, going to some seminars, watching some web, t some TV shows, internet, they have webinars, that's what they're called, webinars, watching webinars, gathering some information so that I can make sure that I don't make the same mistakes that I made in my previous situation with the person who I thought was my person. I might be setting myself up at a dis to a disadvantage the meeting my person. If I'm not going through the proper stages of grieving 
a relationship. I really enjoyed the Hotels album. I thought it was a great album. I love Jasmine Sullivan. I love all of her work. Um, like I said, I think that I'm pregnant. I think it's hers. I 100%. It's either Jasmine Sullivan's baby or Ari Lennox's baby. One of those girls on that song got me pregnant because if you haven't listened to the song Sit On It by Jasmine Sullivan and Ari Lennox, then I'm telling you, you are missing out. If you have not listened to the entire Hotels album by uh, Jasmine Sullivan, you are missing out. It's a great album. It's riddled with a lot of feminine contradictions, but it is a really good album. It's a really, really, really good album. I really enjoyed it, and I think you should give it a listen, and I think you should listen to it in the context of losing a relationship and coming out on the other side because the end of a relationship isn't the end of your life. The end of a relationship doesn't mean that you're bad or you're not worthy of a relationship. The end of a relationship signifies the beginning of the next relationship or friendship or whatever the case may be. I encourage any and everybody to do these two things. Before I get out of here tonight, I want you to, if you haven't already, I've been preaching this for about eight weeks now, the relationship dismount, how to stick the landing when exiting a toxic relationship by Zoe Williams. Get that book. Listen to Hotels by Jasmine Sullivan. Great album. Also, the first Friday and Saturday in May, we are having a men's, a men's get together. It is going to be a workshop centered around the relationship dismount. So, and it's going to be a men's group. I would like to get to the place to where we could do it uh, co-ed, but I just, I just don't see that being very uh, beneficial because oftentimes whenever um, I've, I've been involved in these co-ed relationship situation, it, it, everyone brings their representative. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the ladies bring their stomp down feminist representative and the men bring their stomp down misogynist representative. When I say representative, I mean not our, our authentic self. We come and present this image. Whereas I feel like when it's a group of men, we feel like we can be more vulnerable with each other and we can share information with each other a little more freely. Oftentimes when women are around, men are instantly going into macho mode, instantly peacocking, chest poked out. You know what I mean? Voice changes like we did when we were 16. We used to get that phone call. We found out it was Alicia. Hey girl, I was saying it. You know, we instantly put our cool daddy voice on. So that's why it's a um, it's a it's a men it's a men's group centered, group oriented, group facilitated workshop, and it's going to be the first Friday and Saturday in May, here in Little Rock. Anybody who wants to attend, man, shoot me an inbox if you follow me on Facebook, if you listen on Podbean, Spotify, or YouTube, hit me up at theangrynerd at gmail.com. And just let me know that you're interested in going and I will send you the location as to where it's going to be. It's nothing fancy. Just me and the guys renting an Airbnb for two days. And for two days, we're going to go through the uh, relationship dismount, how to stick the landing when exiting a toxic relationship. And so bring your notepads, bring your recording devices, because we're going to take a lot of notes. We're all going to share our thoughts, beliefs and opinions about it. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some drinks. It's going to be great. Anyways, I hope you guys got something out of tonight's show. I hope you guys had a good time. As always, I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. I don't even have all the questions. But what I do have are particular views and opinions about things that hopefully get the conversation going, hopefully get things moving in, in one direction or another. Hopefully there's a positive outcome. My name is Arshawn Wade, a.k.a. The Angry Nerd. Peace.